We've got a lot of news today. The biggest story is definitely the 9800X 3D and just the overall CPU market now that we've had all the big releases. Uh, but we also have a whole bunch of other stories like AMD versus Intel in the overall data center market with Nvidia also becoming the world's most valuable company and some uh, early Black Friday deals on GPUs, some Steam updates. Uh, some stuff in the console space is developing, some Kingdom Come Deliverance 2 performance, and no Denuvo news. The point is, we've got a lot of stories to cover today, but let's start with the 9800X 3D. Overall, reviews look excellent. I've read and watched a whole bunch of them. Uh, the big comparison a lot of people wanted to see was how about against the 7800X 3D? A lot of outlets, by the way, all my sources will be in the video description, have shown even stronger performance versus the 7800X 3D than AMD had claimed. AMD had claimed a 8% uplift, hardware unbox sees an 11% uplift. If I go to computer base and set the 7800X 3D as the baseline, they're seeing a 14% uplift. The point is we are seeing in general a larger uh, uh, performance leap generationally than AMD claimed, which is the opposite of what we saw with their earlier 9000 non-3D part releases. Uh, where AMD had been claiming a larger generational jump than actual third-party review outlets found. So this time around, AMD has either learned their lesson or corrected their internal testing or communication between testing and marketing. Whatever it was, um, this seems to have actually uh, over-delivered compared to maybe an under-promise, which is pretty cool. Um, also, overall, uh, if you look at these specific results, like we go back to this hardware unbox slide where they're showing specifically 7800X 3D versus 9800X 3D, uh, we can see that while there certainly are examples of games where there's little to no performance change, there are some uh, games that are showing closer to a 20% uplift, which is actually pretty remarkable. So uh, while the averages might be hanging around closer to you know that 11%-ish range, Depending on the specific game, you could be seeing something significantly larger than even that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, however, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best deal out there right now or even pushing the like performance to dollar forward if that's what you're worried about. Uh, because, for example, Gamers Nexus had an interesting look at, uh, depending on how the 7800X 3D is priced, uh, which has been kind of fluctuating in the current market as I think they're probably winding down sales on those so that it's not directly competing with the new 9800X 3D in the market. Um, it, it's potentially the case that a 7800X 3D still could offer better frames per dollar. But the 9800X 3D is definitely offering the best overall performance out of any CPU out there. In fact, if you look at it compared to, a, uh, to Intel's new flagship 285K, it's kind of staggering. Like absolutely mind-blowing uh, advantage here of 38% according to computer bases testing. Different outlets have different numbers and all my sources will be linked in the video description. To be clear, I am not a CPU reviewer, so I am giving you my thoughts on, a ver uh, on kind of a meta-analysis of what I saw in reviews today, um, not, not based on my own testing, to be clear. And all of these sites are worth visiting to get their full look at it and their full data points. But again, if we look at computer base, where they have a nice chart where you can scroll down and set anything as a 100% baseline, so you can see the relative performance differences from there. That's why I've selected this particular chart. Um, yeah, again, we can see that the 9800X 3D offering a 38% advantage in the suite of games they tested, which was Anno 1800, Baldur's Gate 3, Cyberpunk 2077, City Skylines 2, Dragon's Dogma 2, F124, Frostpunk 2, Ghost of Tsushima, Homeworld 3, Horizon Forbidden West, Outcast, New Beginning, Senua Saga, Hellblade 2, Star Wars Outlaws, Starfield, and Warhammer 40K. Anyway, uh, Space Marine 2 specifically. Anyway, the point is... Uh, they tested a lot of games and found a 38% advantage. That is, um, like, it's hard to state how much that is. If you think about in terms of a generational CPU uplift is sometimes, like, 10%, 15%, 20% on, like, maybe a really good generation as we're going now, um, that means that AMD is potentially two to three generations ahead of Intel. 
Now, it's possible that Intel will uh, have a very large performance jump in, in, in the future, like maybe immediately after their uh, 285K. But like, as far as more typical generation uplifts go, uh, this could take many years for Intel to catch up to the gaming performance of the 9800X 3D. Um, their 14900K uh, is also kind of hanging out uh, at uh, the 9800X 3D being 29% ahead in this particular test. Now, I know some people might have issues with them using the kind of uh, uh, DDR5-5600 for these CPUs, um, but the point is, even if you allow faster memory and things like that, it does adjust the percentages a bit, but like, it's not a, uh, a massive difference here. And these are what's generally, uh, what, you know, this, this brand of testing is basically, this is what's certified to be what, what you can get. And again, even the 9800X 3D could benefit from like DDR5-6000 instead of 5600. Anyway, uh, long story short, this is a, a massive difference. Now, there's some other interesting stuff to note as well in these reviews, uh, which is if you look at the uh, productivity testing, there's a... Uh, a larger uplift uh, compared to the 9700X than you would expect in productivity when the only real advantage for the 9800X 3D is that, that 3D vCache. And in a, lot of, um, in a lot of tests, the 3D vCache itself wouldn't necessarily be that helpful unless it was alleviating a different bottleneck elsewhere on the CPU. A lot of reviewers have pointed out that this is evidence that the 9000 series parts were held back by their I.O. die uh, because the, their, their I.O. die is um, not upgraded from the 7000 series. So if that's the bottleneck on the CPU, having the larger cache to not have to access system memory as frequently um, you know, you know that can uh, kind of counteract, uh, in other words, alleviate some of that bottleneck. Um, so that is actually interesting in that, to me, that indicates that AMD has an easy place to gain some performance for their next generation of processors, uh, where if they upgraded to a new I.O. die, uh, and then uh, even didn't actually improve anything else on the 9000 series, it would probably... Uh, give them some performance gains. Now, hopefully if they, that was combined with also actually improving other things, <laughs> um, you know, the point is like there's room for some uh, some gains here as evidenced by that uh, kind of inter interpretation of all of this. So anyway, long story short, uh, this 9800X 3D is certainly impressive. Uh, it's a little bit scary to think about where Intel's actually at here in, in terms of gaming performance. And if we go beyond gaming performance uh, and start to look at more like the larger market, uh, it, it's really looking bad for Intel. Uh, we have headlines that AMD is overtaking Intel in quarterly data center revenue for the first time with Epic CPUs and Instinct AI accelerators showing their dominance. If we wanna look at the actual numbers here, uh, you can see what we're looking at here is AMD data center revenue versus Intel data center revenue in blue. A A AMD is orange. The white line needs to be interpreted very carefully because it is not an apples to apples comparison. This is Nvidia, but only their networking revenue, meaning they have intentionally taken out the compute. So all of those big, uh, you know, uh, all the AI accelerators and everything, uh, that's taken out of this. Uh, so, a, I, in other words, like for an apples to apples comparison, let's look at AMD versus Intel here. You can see that Intel, for a long time, if, if you just go back to 2021, for example, uh, Intel is off the charts better than AMD here, who's in orange, uh, and climbed faster than AMD did going in, through uh, a, a chunk of 2022. However, they start a precipitous decline kind of flatline for a bit and then another precipitous decline and then flatlining maybe coming up a little bit right here. Uh, but if you'll get AMD in this time frame, especially coming in at the end of the uh, of 2023, we see a large jump uh, and then uh, a pretty steady climb from there. So it's looking like overall AMD is gaining ground while Intel is losing it in the data center segment. And that's pretty brutal. And then if we look more at the um, you know, consumer side of things, 
uh, which admittedly I, I think is less of a big business than the data center stuff. Uh, and we're now seeing the absolute dominance for like the DIY market, at least in performance, and that has to start translating more and more into sales uh, in, in the um, you know gaming CPU side of things. But what about the uh, the the uh, graphics situation? Maybe Intel has some room for growth here. Well, the latest headlines on that are pretty bad as well. Intel might give up on dedicated ARC GPUs. Now, where is this headline coming from? Because a lot of people have been eagerly anticipating what Intel might do with their second generation of discrete GPUs to follow up on ARC Alchemist with ARC Battle Mage. Uh, well, it's looking like if you trace this down to the source, um, it's a quote from uh, Intel's CEO during a earnings call. Uh, so talking to investors and they are uh, legally obligated to try to be honest about what they're telling investors. <laughs> anyway, um, the direct quote here is similarly in the client product area, simplifying the roadmap, fewer SKUs to cover it. How are we handling graphics and how that is increasingly becoming a large integrated graphics capabilities. So less need for discrete graphics in the market going forward. So right there, the quote is less need for discrete graphics in the market going forward. Now, does that mean they are not going to offer discrete graphics for Battle Mage? He did not say that. So let's be clear, that was not stated. However, we also didn't hear him mention discrete Battle Mage GPUs. So the only thing we've heard about future discrete graphics uh, from Intel is that there's less need for it moving forward because of a, a, it looks like a growing um, uh, performance and need for integrated graphics. Now, uh, again, that doesn't mean there won't be any of those discrete cards, but it, it and, and actually, if you look at the performance on like the Lunar Lake uh, integrated graphics and things like that uh, on the mobile side of things, which I don't cover quite as much on the channel, uh, the, the integrated graphics performance is looking pretty good. So their work on um, Arc GPUs does seem to have paid off for their integrated graphics. But a lot of us DIY market people would love to see some competition, at least in the low end and low mid range, uh, where a lot of people are actually spending their money. If you look at the Steam hardware survey, um, We'd love to see more competition there. And uh, statements like this is a little bit concerning for anybody uh, excited about that. Now, speaking of the overall market and all of that, I did mention at the beginning that Nvidia, on the other hand, has once again eclipsed Apple for the world's most valuable company as judged by market capitalization. And again, this is being pushed uh, entirely by that AI center dominance. There, there's still a massive demand for their AI acceleration and um, that, that is being borne out in their market capitalization. It'll be interesting to see if uh, you know companies can come up with some sort of uh, alternative in the long run, but at least for now, uh, with the CUDA in terms of API and then their um, actual accelerator chips, uh, being, being quite dominant, um, yeah, that, that's what's backing them on that market capitalization. That means they're now worth more than Meta and Amazon combined, which is absolutely crazy. Now, if you want to buy one of their GPUs, unfortunately, that means they can charge a uh, premium for them. However, with Black Friday coming in, we are starting to see some early Black Friday sales. For example, I'm seeing MSI. Uh, on their own website offering a 4070 Ti Super Expert uh, for $729, down from the 799 MSRP. And uh, that is a better price than these usually sit at. Uh, the 4070 Ti Supers are especially interesting in that they're the uh, first NVIDIA GPU with um, 16 gigabytes of VRAM from a pricing standpoint, other than the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte, which is generally maybe not performant enough for high-end gaming. So if you want high-end gaming with 16 gigabytes of VRAM and you want an NVIDIA GPU, um, this is kind of the starting point. So seeing this one come down is, I think, particularly interesting. Uh, so there is that. Now on some other quicker stories, 
Uh, I do want to mention that uh, I w I've been looking out for if we get system requirements for Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, because uh, I like to cover system requirements on the channel. And while I didn't quite get official system requirements yet, uh, we do have developers saying it will be buttery smooth on even an RTX 3050 and that it won't have de novo on PC, uh, which is good news. This is coming from, uh, uh, looks like a conversation with uh, uh, at, at uh, WCCF Tech and they do talk about uh, the performance numbers. So um, they're saying uh, specifically, yes, absolutely, so don't worry about that. We learned from what we did with Kingdom Come Deliverance. We took away, uh, we took way more time than in the first game for bu bug fixing, optimization, performance testing, and so on. We're working on this right now, and not only on PC, but also on consoles for the console players. So there's good news for everyone. Give us a tiny little bit more time, but I think by the end of the year, we should be able to tell you exactly what you should get. In other words, I would expect one of the more detailed system requirements charts coming out towards the end of the year. Uh, but he's saying, I personally at home play on a 3050 GPU, I think. He says, I think he has a 3050, so maybe he doesn't even know what he has. But he does say it runs buttery smooth. Um, anyway, so there, there is that. And again, they did confirm no de novo or any DRM system at all. So that's pretty cool. I think a lot of PC gamers will be happy to see that. Uh, now, also I'll mention in the PC space that if you use Steam, which many of us do, uh, they have now released their game recording feature as a uh, full implementation into Steam for everybody. This has been available, I think, as more of a beta branch type thing for a while now. Uh, this does allow you to record, replay, clip, and share. Uh, directly within the Steam overlay. A lot of other ways already exist to do these things, but it's now supported by Steam itself and can be hardware accelerated by AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I think you can set it to record up to your last 120 minutes of gameplay, and then you could go back to any of that to uh, you know clip uh, anything you want to share and all of that. So having that functionality directly within uh, Steam, I think is... Uh, only a good thing. It's even uh, supported on Steam Deck. However, uh, on a weaker hardware like that, there could be potentially some performance impact from enabling it. So, so uh, do be aware if you're planning on doing that. Now, more on the console side of things, uh, we are seeing Nintendo officially announcing that they will have backwards compatibility on their next console. Uh, so they do specifically say that Nintendo Switch software will also be playable on the successor to the Nintendo Switch. They're still not calling it Nintendo Switch 2, uh, but they will are, are officially discussing the successor to the Nintendo Switch, and it will be backwards compatible. And Nintendo Switch Online will be available as well. They're not seeming to conflate the two, so it doesn't seem like they're just mentioning some sort of online service to provide backwards compatibility. Um, Anyway, so, and they're saying that there will be more information about the successor at a later, later date, although they aren't going into any more detail or specifics on that. The last bit of console news I'll mention is uh, as we're getting more and more discussion of uh, the PS5 Pro and what kinds of enhancements and performance gains we get, one of the most interesting things is PSSR. Uh, but it's been interesting to see that the first Descendant developers have discussed not only using PSSR, but combining it with AMD frame generation. So it does look like it is compatible. So you could use the PSSR upscaling, which seems to have better image quality than AMD's FSR upscaling. But Sony, at least up till now, hasn't seemed to uh, develop their own frame generation variety. So it's looking like that is compatible, at least within Unreal, en uh, Unreal Engine, uh, as I think uh, the first Descendant is an Unreal Engine 5 game. So that's pretty cool to see. All right, hopefully you guys found today's video useful and or interesting. If you want to support what I do here directly, consider hitting the join button down below. Uh, and uh, you can read the little uh, uh, extras and features and whatnot you get if you choose to do so as a thank you. Uh, but I totally understand that's not within everybody's budget or something you need to do. So just thank you to those who have, but also thank you to people who subscribe, like videos, comment, um, all of that. What I do here is definitely only possible because of all of you. So huge thank you, and I hope all of you have an excellent day.